uh, well, never mind. Okay, so randomness, uh, we all know it, we love it, we can't live without it. Uh, not just us, but also other people, uh, you know, who do algorithms, especially sublinear algorithms, uh, distributed computing, uh, and so forth. The question is, where does randomness come from? That's uh, is really sort of a fundamental question that we've been thinking about for a, for a long time. Um, the you know, when we design algorithms and uh, cr crypto systems, we we think of the ideal world, where um, you get. Uh, a uniformly random sequence of bits on demand. You, you keep pressing buttons. There is uh, a gnome inside your uh, your computer. Uh, it flips bits, and you know, truly random, you know, unbiased IID bits, and keeps. This is the ideal world. Right? That's great. Uh, and keep it going. I, 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 I'm pretty proud of uh, the. Uh, <laughs> just keep it going. But 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 look, the ideal world has to end. The ideal. Say again. That's I know. <laughs> Not such a good norm after all. <laughs> or rather, I don't know how to make animations better than this. <laughs> That's more like it. Um, so again, make it stop. <laughs> I did. <laughs> I did. <laughs> anyway, the ideal world has to come to an end at some point, and it did. Um, so really, the, where does randomness really come from? And, and to be honest, I don't know the answer, but, uh, but here's what I'm told. Um, you, uh, you get sort of uh, random bits from the timing of interrupts. In, uh, in your operating system, um, transistor noise, mouse movements, stock prices, apparently. Um, and anyone know who this, what, what this is, what this object is? It's a lava lamp, yeah? I, I didn't know. I mean, say something about me, I suppose. Um, and, and apparently, people use uh, this device to, uh, to generate randomness. It's not a joke. Uh, you know, um, I was at, a, um, at an NSF uh, meeting uh, a couple of months ago. And there was a guy from uh, this uh, company called Cloudflare that, uh, that uses lava lamps to, uh, to generate randomness. As people go to do crazy things. And then cats. <laughs> Say again. What? What, what, what? And then cats and, uh, and so forth. OK, so, um, so lots of sources. And, but really, my favorite source is this. Uh, <laughs> She is an infinite. Uh, she generates infinite sequences of random-looking bits uh, on demand. You know, uh, I have to feed her, but uh, you know. It's okay. <laughs> um, so the thing is about with all these sources, the output sequence of uh, bits that it generates, you know, you can assume that it has some entropy, but as you can see, it's uh, it's clearly not uh, random. So again, this is a problem that we've been thinking about for a, for a long time in the, in the TOC community. How do you extract uh, randomness from a source that only has entropy? And entropy for me will mean the standard notion of min entropy at this point, right? And I hope everyone's familiar with it. Okay, so what we want to do is uh, we want to construct an algorithm called an extractor, ext here, uh, which has the following property for any source x with enough min entropy, you feed the extractor with the source, out comes uh, something that is uh, random or close to random, indistinguishable from random, whatever that means. Okay, statistically close to random. That's what you want, ideally. And uh, you know, that would have been great if it were possible, but the bad news is that this, you know, for a long time, has been the case that uh, this is impossible. What, I, what I'm asking for here is not possible. Okay, and the proof is uh, sort of one line. This is like the, you know, the, the first problem said, first problem in any course on, uh, I don't know, extractors, uh, randomness. Um, right, so, so, so why? Let's recall it. Um, suppose that such an extractor exists, right? Here's a source that would make the extractor always output zero. Just pick from, let's say the extractor outputs one bit for simplicity. Uh, pick from the set of all strings where the extractor outputs zero or one. Either one of these two, one of these two sets has size more than half the size of the universe, right? So if I sample randomly from the set, it has enough min entropy, at least n minus one bits of min entropy. You feed the extractor with it, it dies. Poor thing, right? That's why what I'm asking for is impossible in general. We found many different ways to sort of get around this very simple impossibility result. I know of at least three ways, and I'm really only going to talk about one of the ways here. And that is the notion that leads us to the notion of seeded extractors. Right, so here the idea is um, you don't let the extractor kind of run by uh, himself. You seed him, you, you, you feed him, you, you, uh, you put a, a truly random string in its head, 
So, that is S here, it will be S for the rest of this talk. And then you feed the extractor with an X and uh, out comes extractor of S comma X. Okay. And now things are much better, it turns out. Okay, so um, and in particular, the guarantee you can get is if X has sufficient mean entropy, and, and here is the crucial thing, if the seed is uniformly random and independent of the source, then what you get out is, uh, is, a, is a uniformly random string, close to uniform. Okay, that is what you get. Okay, it is all classical stuff. And uh, really, I want to think about sort of sources and distinguishers and so forth operationally, even though everything is sort of statistical, unbounded, there is no polynomial time here. I want to think about them operationally. So the source is an algorithm that generates x, maybe polynomial time, maybe not. And a distinguisher is something that gets the output, either the extractor applied on x or a uniformly random string, and it distinguishes, says which one is, uh, which one it gets. Right? That is again an algorithm. It could either be polynomial time or unbounded, I do not care. It is an algorithm. Okay, so in reality, what you want is is a stronger notion, um, which which, I, which which is called strong seeded extractor. And what does this say? Roughly speaking, you want to say that uh, the entropy in R comes not from the seed, which is uniformly random, but rather from the source, right? So you know R could simply be S itself, and that wouldn't be fair, right? So you want really the entropy to come from the source. Another way to think about it is that, you know. Um, when the adversary sees the randomness, this randomness is used for what? For cryptography, probably, right? And you want this crypto system to be secure even after the fact when, you know, an adversary, this guy looks pretty adversarial, right? He gets into the device, he extracts the seed, and then he can do all sorts of things that he wants. You want, in some sense, everlasting security, right? You want this R to be random even in a future where S is somehow known. And that's where strong, seeded extractors come into picture. Yeah, does it make sense? It's all standard stuff, really. Okay, and that's what we will sort of, that's the notion that we will sort of think about, improve today. Okay, so again, just to sort of reiterate this, the use case is that you choose S once and for all, the seed once and for all, you put it in a device uh, and use it to extract from nature. The source is, you know, any one of these things that I mentioned, um, uh, before and you ex keep extracting from nature. Yeah. So this is what it, is what it looks like. Okay. So so in other words, the the philosophy is that the source of nature is uh, is unknown. Yeah. I don't know what this distribution is really, and it depends on which source it comes from. But it's benign in the sense that it's not trying. It's nature. Okay. It's benign. But the adversary is potentially trying to really sort of get into your device, extract the seed, do adversarial things like that. And you know the, because. The source, because of this philosophy, it's okay to assume, uh, presumably okay to assume that uh, X is independent, the source is independent of the seed, yeah? Because the source is generating sort of stuff. I don't know what it is, but you know, why would it potentially, why would it, why would it depend on, uh, why would it depend on the seed, yeah? We probably can poke holes at it right away as we, as we are a room of cryptographers, right? And in fact, that's what we are going to do. Okay. In the real world, as much as the real world is real, um, you know, uh, what I want to think about again is a setting where I pick a seed, put it in a device, put it in my computer, and then I keep extracting from nature. In other words, the nature generates x1, you extract, right? Randomness. And now what happens? What, do, what does this randomness do? You use it to, to run programs, you know, algorithms, and the output of the algorithms do something, and I can observe this something. For instance, you know, um, what happens in, in my house is uh, you take this randomness, you feed it into Spotify, you know, uh, and it uh, generates one song or the other. How many people know what's on top? I, I can see a bimodality uh, here, right? <laughs> uh, baby shark, yeah? Once you hear it, you cannot unhear it. Try it, <laughs> or maybe not try it. <laughs> Uh, okay, so one thing or the other, baby, baby shark or Bach, my daughter has very different reactions to these two things, and she produces very different sources depending on it the next time around. So X2 potentially depends on the output of the extractor on X1, and therefore it implicitly depends on the seed. And this happens, you can think about this situation happening 
all over the place. Right? And, and really, this is a phenomenon that, that, uh, that we address in the context of extractors, but people have thought about this phenomenon for a, for a long time in other contexts. I'll mention some of these later. Okay, so is it clear? We are thinking about a repeated game, and we are thinking about inputs that are potentially chosen depending on the Oracle, uh, really an adaptive game. Yeah. That is my real world for, for, for today's talk. Does that make sense? Yes. But not conditioned on the, uh, on, uh, on uh, X2 and R1 potentially reveal information about the source. Uh, about the seed, sorry, about the seed. Yeah, so, so X2 potentially depends on R1, which together with X1 reveals information about the seed. Therefore, the whole thing, X2 could depend on the seed implicitly somehow. Yeah? Yes? Yeah, so it's sort of a, sort of a design choice. I, I want to reveal the seed. I want to consider adversaries that, uh, after the fact, can get into the device, you know, break the device. As we know, devices are, you know, all devices are breakable. That's what, it is a design choice, right? And this actually makes for an interesting paper. The other one for probably will. Completely honest, between you and me, yeah? Yes, yes, yes. Of course, of, co uh, of course, of course. That, that, that is the point, yeah, indeed. Thank you. Okay, so, so in our work, we look at extractor dependent sources, uh, which is a, formal, a formalization of uh, what, we, what we just talked about. And, uh, and the way we formalize it is uh, the nature is actually a polynomial time. Well, never mind. It's an algorithm. Could either be polynomial time or unbounded. But in any case, it has Oracle access to the, to the source, to the, to, the, to, the, to the extractor. Yeah? So you can feed the extractor with inputs. Potentially, these are inputs with min entropy, but may not be. Yeah, it's an arbitrary algorithm with Oracle access to the extractor. So some invocations of the extractor may not have any, uh, could be on strings like 0, 0, 0, okay? So uh, that's, that's, that's fine. Yeah, does it make sense? This is the source. A source is an algorithm, used to be an algorithm before, which output a string. Now the algorithm has Oracle access to the extractor. That's the only difference. Okay, so, so you know, I can't sort of work with arbitrary such sources, and you couldn't work with arbitrary such sources in the randomness extracting literature either. The, co the minimal condition is that X has the output has enough uh, min entropy, in fact, min entropy even conditioned on uh, the seed. Because that's the first condition I want. The second condition I want is that uh, the sampler, I, I, I don't want X to be something that the sampler previously queried, because if it did, then, uh, you know, again, X has, uh, um, um, it, it, this sort of notion would be impossible. Okay, so two conditions. One, the x, the, the output to the source has enough min entropy. Uh, that's the usual condition. And the new thing here in the Oracle setting is that we don't want this, we want the output of the sampler to be fresh, to be, to be at the very least, something that doesn't depend, uh, something, at the very least, it's not something that uh, the sampler queried uh, beforehand. Say again, to totally, yeah, that could, that's, that's, so this is a stronger definition, right? I could have required that X has entropy conditioned on the view of the, uh, the sampler, but I'm saying, you know, I don't want, necessarily want that. This is a stronger definition. Okay, so same game as before. Same game as before. Everything here is exactly the same as for strong seeded extractors, except that the source has Oracle access to the, to the seed. The, the particular string that is, so, so think about an execution of the, of the sampler. Right? Think about an execution of the sampler. It makes a bunch of queries, and it outputs an X. I'm saying that the probability that X is in the set of queries, X1 up to XQ, is negligible. In fact, let's say, never occurs. So you think about the source of the machine with the Oracle access to the extract. Indeed. The string yes, yes, yes. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a it's randomized it's machine. machine. Sorry? It's a, it's a machine, yeah, right. No, no, I thought, I thought X was a distribution. No, no, it's an, it's out, I want to think about it operationally. Okay, this is an output of a randomized algorithm, polynomial time or not, doesn't matter, right? That's, uh, we, we want to take one of the queries, one bit flip, that's okay. Say again? Maybe, but you will see it's very different too, in a minute. 
in a minute. Um, good, so that's one definition. Of course, in cryptography, we love auxiliary inputs, right, uh, you know, for a good reason. Uh, and you can think about the variant um, here where the source not just outputs x for extraction, but it also outputs some uh, side information about, uh, about, about x. Yeah, that's the auxiliary input. The distinguisher gets the seed, the auxiliary input, and either the output of the extractor or randomness, and it says, well, it has to say which one is which. Yeah, so far so good? Okay, very good. It's a notion, uh, okay, it's time to breathe. Yeah, questions? Okay, all right, well, it's all trivial. Well, maybe. Okay, so uh, related work, we are not the first people to study this. Uh, the re a recent work of uh, Coretti, Dodis, to other people, um, they study the special case where the extractor is a, is a random oracle, right? A random oracle is a very good extractor, um, right? And the question is, you can ask the same question uh, with a random oracle. Uh, and there, there, the notion is uh, uh, that the sampler gets oracle access to the extractor, in other words, the random oracle, right? It outputs a string. Um, and uh, the distinguisher gets the whole seed, which is the entire random oracle, and it's unbounded. Right? Uh, so it's very similar to our setting, except that the extractor is, uh, is a random oracle. And they prove that uh, random oracle is a, is a very good uh, extractor in this setting, even if the distinguisher after the fact gets the entire random oracle. Uh, and this is true even with, uh, with auxiliary information. Okay, and really what we are doing is we study the problem in, a, in, a, in the standard model. Well, so, so, so what does it mean random oracle with preprocessing? The question is, what properties do you want from the random oracle in the presence of preprocessing? The older works of Evgeny studied the question of a one-way function. Is the random oracle a one-way function even with preprocessing? Is it a two random generator? Is it a collision risk resistance function? So on and so forth. And the, here he studies sort of extraction. Right? So, so this is, is one, another property of uh, random oracle. That, uh, so what we want to do is we want to study this question, except, you know, I love random oracles, but not today. Uh, we want to study this in the standard model. Yeah, yeah sure. Yeah. 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 What do you? Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you are like too slight. How can you learn? Okay, you know what? Now that we are in a conversation, how can you? Ah. Too slight. Okay, so, so th this is, again, one could place this work in the, in the, in the setting of uh, randomized algorithms, which reuse their randomness. And this happens, again, all over the place in hashing, randomized data structure, morning, thank you. Uh, sketching, locality sensitive hashing, and so forth. And there, again, the question is, you know, if I, how are the inputs chosen? Either the inputs you can assume are chosen non-adaptively, independent of uh, the seed, in which case the guarantees look like for every x1 up to xq, the probability of blah, 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 blah over the hash function is something, right? But really what we want to say is x1, I feed it into the system, I see something about the output, and then depending on it, I choose x2, and I feed it, blah, right? Exactly the same case. This has been studied since at least the work of uh, Lot, Lot, um, Lipton and Norton, Lipton and Norton, yeah. Okay, good. So what are our results? Uh, thank you, Yael, <laughs> for, for ruining the surprise, number one. Um, yeah, so this is impossible to achieve information theoretically, and we'll see in a minute the proof, and this Yael already, if you understood what she said, the proof. Okay, so, so the sampler, the, the, the corollary is that the sampler has to be computationally unbounded. Even if everyone else is computationally bounded, a, a, a computationally bounded, this guy has to be uh, computationally bounded as well. Moreover, this notion implies one-way functions, right? So you could ask, why did all these work on randomness extractors uh, not consider this notion? You know, it implies crypto. You have to, the starting point is that without crypto, you cannot achieve this notion. Okay, so, okay, so that's the that's bad news. The good news is that without auxiliary input, the definition without auxiliary information, 
any pseudo random function is a good uh, uh, EBX structure, even if the distinguisher is unbounded. Because remember, the sampler has to be bounded. That's what the first result says. And then you can ask, you know, what about the distinguisher? It could be computationally unbounded, and then we get actually this very nice result. Yeah, in, in, in a sense, it is very, yeah, right. It's very related to, uh, yeah. Uh, again. Say again. E ED, good, I didn't say it. Um, ED extractor is an extractor uh, for extractor dependent sources. ED is extractor dependent. It's a terrible name. But uh, you know, if you have better suggestions, you know. Uh, Yes, we'll see in a, just a minute. We'll see actually the theorem and the uh, the seed is the is a PRFT. Say again. I think it will be strong. That's the whole point of that theorem. Otherwise, it'll be a trivial theorem. It's slightly non-trivial because uh, because uh, the, you know eventually the PRFT gets leaked to the distinguisher. You guys are really giving the talk for me. I mean, uh, <laughs> what, what's the, it's good. It's good. Good simulators. Um, We'll get we'll get there, Hugo. Um, okay, so you know in the in the in the setting without this extractor dependent thing, you know this classical uh, randomness extraction setting, whether the source output auxiliary information on the extractor or on the source or not, it didn't significantly change things. You could apply the same extractor as long as the source had entropy conditioned on the auxiliary input, you'd be okay. So things didn't really change very much. Here, stuff is very very different, as you might expect. So with auxiliary information, the first thing we can show is that we can't possibly prove a theorem as strong as we proved with, without auxiliary info, right? In the sense, we can show PRFs, which are not good uh, ED extractors. That's a bad news. Bad news always comes with good news, which is we give three constructions of ED extractors with auxiliary information um, under all sorts of uh, assumptions, you know, LWE, DDH, uh, blah, 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 blah. Okay, all sorts of assumptions that you can think of. Okay. Another sort of key distinction between the, our auxiliary information results and the without, with and without auxiliary information results is that in the without auxiliary information result, our output is good even against an unbounded distinguisher, whereas all we can show for the auxiliary information setting is that, you know, the output is only good for a polynomial time distinguisher, right? So that's a, that's a deficiency in the auxiliary information result. The other deficiency is that we need all sorts of crazy assumptions here, some acronyms that throw away, you know, like LWE, DDH, blah, blah, blah. That thing also has an acronym, but it should run a function. Everyone knows this, yeah? It's a nice acronym, yeah? And these are the two deficiencies of our auxiliary information result. Okay. Jesus Christ. Uh, yeah, so so for all our deficiencies, we have we have explanations for why we fail, and we call them black box separations. That's a, that's the uh, euphemism to uh, explain your failure. Okay. okay, so that's that's what it is. We'll see how far I get. What? How much time do I have? Twenty minutes. Okay, that's good. Very good. Okay, the first slide is uh, dedicated to Yael. Um, Ah, no, not this slide. You know what extractor dependent, uh, just to remind you, yeah? Good. Yeah, so the theorem is that if the sampler is computationally unbounded, you cannot possibly achieve this notion. Even if the source has entropy n minus one bits, even if the extractor is only asked to output one bit, even if the distinguisher is polynomial time, all sorts of nice things happen. If the sampler is computationally unbounded, you're, you're screwed. Okay, and why is that? Uh, as you see, you know, if the sampler is unbounded, it makes polynomial number of queries to the oracle. The oracle has bounded description. The seed is sort of a bounded polynomial length. And therefore, it can learn a f essentially the extractor, uh, something that's close enough to the extractor. Um, and, and, and that's that, right? Then the sampler outputs a random x such that this approximation to the extractor output zero, and the approximation is good enough that you are. Yeah, this is a very, very simple result. It's a, essentially what Yael observed. Good, so that's bad news. Uh, if you if you want, uh, if you need it, 
Yeah, so then you can use potentially deterministic extractors with, uh, where you, you don't even need the C, right? Um, yeah. So that's one way to get out of the impossibility of results, to, to limit the running time or the description size of the, of the source. But we don't want to go there, because I don't know. My baby, you know, I, who knows, you know, large description size. <laughs> Sorry? Yes, yes. Yes. Yes, yeah, that's right. So you have to anticipate how, uh, uh, how, uh, uh, how much running time your source has in them. Okay, moreover, it's not just that uh, you can't do this information. Theoretically, uh, such extractors also imply one way function. Okay, so now good news, right? Uh, we're going to play this game over and over. Bad news and then good news and then a little bit of bad news and so on and so forth. So this is the good news part of it, uh, which is that uh, you know, PRF, any PRF is an ED extractor. Let me make this a bit more uh, precise, and that's the picture. The extractor is the PRF, and the, you, you, the, the, the seed of the extractor is the key, is the, the key of the PRF, and uh, that, that's exactly that. Extractor with S is PRF of S, that's it. Yeah? Does this make sense? Good. So the theorem is that this construction is an ED extractor even against unbounded distinguishers. That's the, yeah? Yes? Mm, oh, no. uh, yes and no. Yes, okay, it makes you happy. Uh, and now Zvika will, uh, you know. <laughs> No, yes. Uh, <laughs> okay, all right. Okay, yeah? Good, so this is a theorem. And really, at the end of the day, the challenge is I want to show a reduction which takes a distinguisher for this construction, for this extractor construction, and turn it into an attack for the PRF. But the distinguisher is, uh, is unbounded. Okay, so what, what gives? I mean, I can't possibly use the distinguisher. So how do you use the distinguisher? And the answer is you don't. Okay, there's no possible way to use the distinguisher, and you don't use the distinguisher. Okay, so let me let me tell you the proof in a few words. Assume that the uh, pseudo random function outputs m bits. Okay, and I really want m to be bounded, and that's to Zvika's question. For a moment, if you want, think about one bit. Yeah. So all I can assume is that these two things. S together with uh, the output PRF of X, and S together with U, they are, they are statistically indistinguishable. That's really all I can assume, right? Because the distinguisher is computationally unbounded. The statistical distance, some non negligible epsilon. That's it. Okay. So, okay. So, so now what? Right? How do we use this, this, this claim about statistical distance to say something about polynomial time algorithms? The key is that, uh, is that if you assume that the output of the PRF is bounded, let's say one bit, more or less statistical in, uh, uh, distinguishability uh, turns into computational distinguishability. That's, that's more or less the idea. So I guess concretely, yeah. I was going to ask the, the, where yeah. <laughs> this is, I mean, the, the gap between my slides and your questions is decreasing. So hopefully, you know, your questions will come after my slides later. Uh, we'll see. Uh, yeah, so, so the what, yeah. This, uh, this is impossible, yeah. As in we're getting a depend without a dependence on, on uh, Right. Yeah. yeah. So concretely, what, uh, what you do is the following. Here is how the PRF attack works. Um, Okay, so where does M come in? I mean, one way to do the attack is to translate statistical distance into collision probability, and that's where the two to the M comes from, right? Now you run the PRF with, uh, now you run the oracle with uh, two coins. The sampler is a randomized algorithm, right, with an oracle. You run it with two independent sort of uh, runs of the, you do two independent runs of the sampler, and, uh, you know, if those two are the same, well, I mean, the thing is, you know, if it's the output of the PRF, it is biased one way or the other. You don't know which way it is biased, but it's biased one way or the other. And as long as that is the case, the collision probability will be more than what you expect for truly random, uh, truly random bit. That's what. Uh, 
Yeah, th does it make sense? Good, so the key thing to note here is that this simple idea fails with auxiliary information. Right? This, this simple reduction fails with auxiliary information. Why? Because we, we, are, we, are, we are counting on the fact that the output of both these uh, executions has the same S, I mean it has to have the same S because I use the same oracle, and the R is different and the number of bits in R is very small. That's what I'm using. But with the auxiliary information, once you run it for two different executions, the auxiliary information could be completely different. Then I can't really, I mean, on the face of it, I can't use this trick anymore. Yeah. Yeah. No, 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 no. The distinguisher gets the seed, and it gets the output of the extractor. What do you mean the whole sequence? No, 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 no. Okay, good. So here's the experiment. The source makes a bunch of queries. It outputs uh, a string, right? And the string has to have min entropy. Right? It's a condition. And what the distinguisher gets is the seed, the, the 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 oracle, the description of the oracle, together with the output of the extractor, or random, one of the two, and it has to say which one it is. So the the the, the the source, that's why it's a two-stage game and not a, because again, I think of the source as being nature, you know, uh, why would uh, you as the malicious adversary tomorrow get our Oracle access to what my baby queried, you know, uh, you know what I mean? Like, ah, good. So, so the, what is the reduction here? I run the source twice with independent randomness, so I get two, I, I get an X and X prime, with the same seed because I use the same oracle, right? And now, you know, all I need uh, to translate sort of statistical to computational is the R, which is a bounded number of bits, like one bit or m bits, if you want. But with auxiliary information, it could, the size of the auxiliary information could be unbounded. And two runs of this uh, source will not produce the same, same auxiliary information, right? Let me show you an impossibility, and then uh, you, can, you can go back. Think about it. Okay. So again, the theorem is that uh, you know um, there are ED extractors uh, as long as uh, the source has entropy a little bit more than uh, the output. Actually. Okay. Good. Yeah. So now let's go and see. First of all, why does this construction not work um, for? Uh, in the case of auxiliary inputs. In particular, I want to show that there are PRFs, in fact, two different constructions of PRFs, which are PRFs, and yet, if you plug it, if you, if you try to make a uh, ED extractor out of them, they'll fail. Vika, all good? Life is reasonable so far? <laughs> okay, that's as much as you get. Um, yeah? Okay. All right. So. Auxiliary information, here is the definition, right? You know, the only change from before is that the distinguisher, the source produces an auxiliary information together with X, and the distinguisher gets this auxiliary information as well. And again, I didn't write this down. We condition, we, we, uh, our condition is that X, the output of the source, is entropy given the auxiliary information. Okay, again, let's start with bad news. Yes. But we did say something about the. Uh, so what, 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 what property of PRF are you using? What property of the source am I using here? Rather, the the the, the point is that the source outputs uh, a string with uh, um, uh, with min entropy. So so there is randomness, uh, you know, in the uh, um, that the source uses, which is not available to the uh, to the distinction. Okay. I am using the fact that uh, the source is uh, computationally bounded. 
if the source were computationally unbounded, this wouldn't, uh, this construction won't work. I don't know if that answers your question. So, the, you know, we have a two-stage game. One stage is polynomial time bounded, and I really want to use the fact that it's polynomial time bounded. And the other side only gets one bit of information. So, you know, uh, and somehow the point is that there, it doesn't matter if that guy is uh, polynomial time or unbounded because it's only one bit. So, uh, so it's roughly speaking what it is. I don't know if that convinces you. Yeah, Zviga. No, no, that's the thing. So we want x to have minentropy conditioned on the auxiliary input. So think about auxiliary input as leakage, right? I mean, this is what, what we're used to in the randomness extraction setting, right? As long as x has enough conditional minentropy, you know, given the auxiliary input, you should be able to sort of uh, extract. Yeah? 10 minutes? OK, so let me not give you too much bad news, just one, OK? Um, here is a construction of a PRF. It's a PRF, but if you plug it into the construction that we just saw, it won't be a good ED extractor anymore. Okay, so here's the construction. So take a PRF, take any PRF, and modify it so that it first hashes the output into something small, and then applies the PRF on it. Stop the PRF on it. Okay, so it's still a PRF. Um, and now what is the source? The source samples a random X, and then the auxiliary information is the hash of X. So now, conditioned on the auxiliary information, the source has enough entropy. It's all good, right? And then you're, you're stuck. Okay, why? Because now if you apply uh, the extractor, which is F, S of H of X, it is something that you can predict from the auxiliary information alone. So that's not good. Yeah? So really, the point is that the auxiliary information here is not one bit, not two bits. It's a security parameter number of bits. And that's why we can't run the proof before. And here's a counterexample. If you want a counter another counterexample using FHE, uh, you, know, you can do this as well. Uh, there are tons of counterexamples you can construct. Okay. So bottom line, without auxiliary information, PRFs were very good. Just the PRF itself. You don't need to do anything complicated. That's not great with, uh, with auxiliary information. So you have to do something different. Okay. Zvika. Yeah, then you can probably do it. But but yeah, that's sort of the point. You, can, you don't want to bound the size of the auxiliary information. I'm happy to bound this output of the extractor. I know one bit is maybe good enough, but uh, um, yeah. OK, so so good news. This is the last thing I'm going to say, uh, probably. Um, and the good news, you get it from a PRF, but not any PRF, rather uh, a constrained PRF. Sorry. I, uh, 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 good. Constrained PRF. Okay, so what is a constraint PRF? A constraint PRF was an object invented by Let and others, uh, you know, uh, let's say sorry. Um, uh, uh, yeah, and what it is is the following. It's a pseudorandom function, which has a key. And what you can do to the key is you can take the key and a circuit C, and a Boolean circuit C, something that outputs zero or one, and you can produce a constraint key. What is a constraint key? You should think about it as something that can, uh, that, that can be used to evaluate the PRF on a subset of the inputs. Which subset? The point is, if c of x is 1, if x is such that c of x is 1, then given the constraint key, you can compute PRF of x. Right? So the constraint key reveals a fraction of the truth table of the PRF, which fraction corresponds to where c of x is 1. And for the other ones, it is really pseudo random. Okay? So it's an informal definition, but this is all. Okay, so here's our construction. It's going to be a bit more complicated than uh, just throw PRF at it. Okay, just a bit more. So, okay, so before I go into the construction, let's see what, what is it that we want to do. Right? You know, again, let's go back to what uh, Hugo said. At the end of the day, um, there is a distinguisher. I am giving the distinguisher the PRF key, right, or whatever it is. So there's a seed of the extractor somehow. And if the seed of the extractor where the PRF key, there's nothing hidden anymore, OK? We got around it in the, in the other setting by using the fact that the output of the PRF is small, but we, don't, we can't do this anymore. So, so you have to be invented. In other words, what I want to do is to set the seed of the extractor to be a version of the PRF key 
a version that is nearly as good as a PRF key almost all the place, but, but not exactly, right? It is sort of, it's not exactly the PRF key. In other words, even given this constraint key, it is something that remains hidden, which is exactly the constraint here. That's, that's, the, that's a motivation for sort of going to this complicated uh, draft. It's not complicated, more interesting draft. Okay, so, so what I want to do is, uh, okay, let me, good. So start from the second line. So I am going to pick up PRF key, and I am going to let the extractor be the PRF evaluated on X, except not the PRF with the PRF key K, but rather the PRF using the constrained key K. This notation means the PRF key is constrained on the circuit. Okay, that's what I'm gonna, that's the extractor. So what the extractor gets is really Oracle access to the PRF truth table, except some parts are wiped out. This is the actual construction. This is the actual construction. No, I don't need to hide the constraint. No, I don't. You'll see in a minute. Okay, so what is the constraint? Yeah. Hide the constraint. So, so there's a choice here in the definition of constraint PRF, which is if I give you the constraint key, can you tell what the constraint was? Right? And uh, if you could, then if you couldn't, then you say call it a private constraint PRF. If you could, then you call it a constraint PRF. So you just need a regular constraint here. Okay, so, so what is the constraint? Wh where am I, what is the circuit that I'm using to sort of constrain? It is the following circuit, and the one thing to notice about the circuit is that it is, uh, it's an evasive circuit. In a sense, it, it actually allows the PRF to go out, to output the PRF, in one minus negligible fraction of the places. Only in a negligible fraction of the places is the output constraint. So it's more or less as good as a PRF, yeah. Because you this is because U is long, yeah, exactly. So, yeah, good, I didn't write it, but, but U is long. U is super logarithmic uh, space, okay? So in other words, the constraint allows the release of the PRF value as long as some standard extractor applied on X is not equal to U, which happens a lot of the time. So really, most of the time, you get the PRF value, yeah? Okay, so that's the construction. Now let's uh, go through the proof by pictures. Okay, so here's the game. This is the standard game. The source has Oracle access to the, to the construction, which is a PRF evaluated using the constraint key, right? That's the that. And, uh, and the distinguisher gets the seed, which is what's, yeah, the constraint key, together with the auxiliary input, which is whatever the source outputs, and the output of the extractor, the output of the PRF. Okay. The first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to replace the, uh, the Oracle access to the constrained PRF with the, with the PRF itself, with the unconstrained whole table. The point is you're not going to know the difference. Um, a, these two are indistinguishable because the source is never going to query on a point where the constraint evaluation is different from the PRF evaluation. These points are evasive, they are very small in number, and U is random, so you're never going to switch to that, yeah? So notice that I changed two things here, not three things, okay? So there are three places where the PRF key appears in the Oracle, right, where it could be either the constraint or the real key. The seed, and what the output is computed with. I changed two of these, and but what the distinguisher gets is, is still the constraint key, I didn't change that. I can't possibly change that, right? Because you will tell the difference between a PRF key and a constrained PRF key. Okay, so, so I can't change that. So that's what I. Yeah, does it make sense? And these two things are statistically close because the queries are never going to hit the constraint points, and X is never going to hit the constraint points. Okay, so number one. Number two. Okay, so now let's look at this U. It used to be random before, right? And now if you look at X, the output of the source, it has entropy, right, as it's a condition on the, on the source. And it's independent of T because there was no T in the Oracle. Before it's dead, now there isn't. So you have X that has entropy, it's independent of T, and therefore the extractor uh, is uniformly random. What used to be uniformly random, I could replace it with extractor prime line. 
Yeah, this is statistically close. Um, okay, that's now, this is the key point in the proof. Now notice that all the queries of the source were <coughs> outside the constraint set, but X by definition is in the constraint. Therefore, even if I give you the PRF constraint key, you can't tell what the PRF effect is. And that, with one click, finishes the And this is the only place where we use the computational assumption, that the you know, constraint security is well. Okay, so this was a little bit heavy. Good. Goodish. All right. Okay. Um, theorem, if you look into the proof, you actually need an adaptively secure constraint PRF details, yeah? I mean, but you can get it by complexity leveraging. Um, you also have other constructions, two more constructions, as if one wasn't enough. Uh, There's nothing called shift hiding shiftable functions. Again, I'm not going to define this. And that, there, you don't need this complexity leveraging anymore. You can get it from sort of polynomial security uh, functions. And something called all but one lossy functions. Again, I'm not going to define it. There you can get it from not just polynomial hardness of LWE, but also DDH and uh, Payer assumption, this and that. Also. Are, are we using the fact that the abstraction, the, the physical form takes the the LWE? No, 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 no. Any extraction. You don't care about the. Uh, no, I don't care about the which form the constraint. Uh, uh, so here in the second constraint, the shift hiding thing, you know, there is a shift function, whatever that means, and that can be arbitrary. Okay, so so let's, okay, so I think at least hopefully the theorem statements are, 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 are clear, even though maybe not the proofs. Um, so so let's see, why is, um, why is the auxiliary information setting so hard? I mean, this shouldn't come as a surprise to us, right? You know, in, in cryptography, we have seen this again and again and again. Auxiliary information is the thing that screws up. Obfuscation, for example. I mean, well, uh, that's the, <laughs> there's a different story. Uh, but zero knowledge, right? Uh, auxiliary information make things, makes things harder. So not a surprise. But really what happens with and without auxiliary information is the following, which I said before. Without auxiliary information, you get security for unbounded distinguishers. And with auxiliary information, you only manage to get for polynomial bounded why polynomially bounded in the construction that I showed you. At the end of the day, I had to use the fact that the distinguisher cannot break the train PRF security. So it has to be, uh, has to be polynomial time. The other thing is we had a very simple construction from any PRF for uh, in the without auxiliary information setting. But with auxiliary information, we had all these like uh, public key assumptions, you know, LWE, DDH, whatever that means, you know, Diffie-Hellman, learning with errors, so forth. Okay, so why? why? Why do you need this? Okay, so we have uh, black box separations, uh, right? Uh, why we cannot do, uh, why it's uh, obstruction, okay? Obstructions are either good or bad. They're bad if you just look at the slide, but they're good. They, they tell you what you should do to the constructions to, uh, to get around uh, these problems. Okay, so obstruction one, um, un for unbounded distinguishers. Uh, so there we show that you cannot prove security of any the extractor construction under standard assumptions, where standard assumptions mean, you know, RSA, LWE, any one-stage game, even with sub-exponential hardness. Um, that's across the end. That's for unbounded distinguishers, right? So you have to do something crazy to, to get security for unbounded distinguishers in the auxiliary information setting. Theorem two says, forget unbounded distinguishers, let's try to do polynomial times, try to work against polynomial time distinguishers. The question is, can you get uh, a construction from one-way function? Any PRF, or rather, never mind any PRF from one way function. Right? That's the question. And there we show that uh, you know any construction has to have a, a certain property that uh, PRFs, arbitrary PRFs, don't satisfy, but it tells you where to look for for the construction. So we show that any so called seat committing constructions uh, cannot, uh, cannot possibly work. So what is a seat co committing construction? An extractor function is seat committing if I make there are probably many queries that I can make. If I make the output, I can exactly reconstruct the table of this function. That's the seat committing um, construction. And you know, uh, you can, you know, most standard PRFs appear to be seat committing. Uh, now Rainbow uh, is seat committing 
uh, for example, um, the trying to prove that now Rainbow actually satisfies, is it can be made into an immediate structure, but it can't. Um, that's how we came up with the black box separation. Um, and that's what it is. But crucially, constrained PRFs are not seed committing. Even punctured PRFs are not seed committing. So really my question, open question is, can you use maybe okay, punctured PRFs that you can construct from one-way function to get an extractor construction? That would give you an extractor from a one-way function, but not a trivial problem, not the standard problem. Yeah? So the first theorem, I don't know what to do about it, but the second theorem is to really think about it as a way to potentially get a positive result. We haven't managed to do that, but we're lucky. Okay, so that's basically it. So we find this new notion of uh, extractor-dependent sources, which I really believe that nature sort of behaves this way. Uh, we showed how to extract from these sources. Um, the starting point is that we need cryptography to start even, you know, get off the ground. Uh, but we showed several constructions Things appear much harder, but really in the RJ, you know, are, 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 are we being computationally bound, basically, or uh, you know, me less, more so than uh, my other right. Good. Thank you very much, and let's stop.